That's him. We're all being watched. On streets. In subways. Even in our own homes. Invisible eyes are searching for criminals and terrorists. New technologies can track them before they strike. Intricate surveillance networks. Advanced facial recognition. Let's see if he matches anyone in our database. Even tracking devices implanted inside the body. Technologies that can make the invisible visible. And electronic trails that reveal who we are and where we've been. Go behind the security doors and discover the secret, often disturbing world of surveillance. London, July 7th, 2005. Morning rush hour in the most heavily surveyed city in the world. Over half a million cameras keep watch over Britain's capital. Mechanical eyes loom from every corner. The average Londoner is filmed by more than 300 cameras during the course of their day. A ring of cameras surrounds the center of London. Within seconds, every plate number is fed into a computer that tracks the comings and goings of each vehicle. It seems like the perfect defense. On this Wednesday morning, Three million commuters pack London's cabs, buses, and trains. Closed circuit television operators keep an eye open for any suspicious behavior. But what they don't know is that four men have already set out to commit one of the worst acts of terror in British history. They park their car outside the city, avoiding the ring of traffic cameras, and take the train to the center. The men are caught on camera, but to the authorities, they look like ordinary commuters. No one knows who they are until it's too late. Wearing backpacks full of explosives, they board three trains and a bus. AM, a series of suicide explosions rip out on three subway trains within a minute of each other. Less than an hour later, the top floor of a bus explodes. 52 people die. 700 are seriously injured. Scotland Yard launches their biggest investigation in history. This will take many months of intensive, detailed investigation. They scour countless hours of closed circuit video, searching for glimpses of their suspects. So how did the most elaborate surveillance system of any city in the world fail so completely to prevent the attack? The answer lies hidden in a grungy warehouse in central London, the Westminster Command Center. 
This is just one small piece of a massive video surveillance system stretching across the city. The current figure is roughly 4 million surveillance cameras throughout the UK. If you're in London, Westminster's director, Robert McAllister, can follow nearly every move you make. When you come out of your house in the morning and you get on some form of transport, there's probably a CCTV camera. If you walk down a pedestrian street, if you go into a store, anywhere that you are within the city of London, you're probably at some stage going to be captured on CCTV. Now, I'm not particularly interested in seeing somebody having a cappuccino in their kitchen in the morning. But if your child is abducted, or you're a victim of crime, or somebody burgles your house, you would probably love CCTV. If you're a criminal, then it's going to be the flip side of that coin. CCTV has already proven its value as a way to combat crime. It's this group of four individuals here that we're interested in. August 2004. A group of men attaches an electronic device to a bank machine. They steal card and PIN numbers, and then remove cash again and again from other people's accounts. McAllister's team uses CCTV cameras to bust them. They follow the suspects from camera to camera and carefully guide the police to the correct car so they can block their escape. As the vehicle pulls out, we get a nice shot of the registration plate. You'll see the police vehicle has now stopped that line of traffic. What we've got here now is a successful intervention, possibly leading to an arrest. This is what most of us think of as the power of total surveillance. The all-seeing thousand eyes of Big Brother. Yet it's not enough to catch a bomber intent on destruction. There are two critical limits to closed-circuit surveillance. You have to know who you're looking for, and you have to have a human watching every screen, every minute of every day. We were looking for four individuals, um, tiny clues amongst thousands of hours worth of footage. These cameras captured the bombers nine days before the attack. You've got the guys at Luton Station together. You've then got them congregating at King's Cross Tube Station, all coming together, all going off on their separate ways. It confirms that they actually all were part of the same unit, which is key to the investigation. The challenge for future surveillance, finding people before they commit crimes, a task no simple camera can achieve. A more sophisticated system is already in place. Not to catch terrorists, but to nab car... Every year, more than 35 million visitors flock to this oasis in the desert. Many know that Las Vegas casinos use surveillance cameras, but few realize the extent to which they're being watched. Gaming here is serious business. Gamblers spend more than $6 billion every year, and cheaters can make off with millions. That's why casinos use some of the most high-tech surveillance systems in the world to monitor their clients. Nearly every turn of a card, pull of a handle, or roll of a die is recorded Nine, by invisible eyes. Five, seven. When visitors step inside the giant Aladdin casino to gamble, they enter a wired world. Surveillance. Controlling all this is a man who stays in the shadows. We can see, but we can't be seen. Kind of undercover, eye in the sky, so to speak. Bill Page is director of surveillance and does everything he can to keep his unit out of sight, hidden beneath the glitz and glamour. The average Joe coming in the casino does not look up. They would probably be amazed and say, whoa, look at all those black dots up in the ceiling. I wonder what they're for. They're actually camera domes throughout the whole property. 
The cameras may look simple, but from 40-foot ceilings, they can read the dial on a wristwatch or the serial number on a dollar bill. Here's a tape of a man playing roulette. But look again. No more bets. He tries to place a late bet. There's the bet. The tape shows the man placing chips after the dealer has called off all bets. There's the wave off. And he's pushing chips towards you, the confuser. No more bets. And there's, there's the bet. It's really pretty blatant, actually. But he finds a subtler scam in this game of blackjack. The man is bending cards to mark them and gain an unfair advantage over the house. This individual is bending the high cards out. Right there. Bending cards is a cardinal sin on the floor. Right there. Casinos call it cheating and eject anyone caught doing it. Right there. It's considered altering the outcome of the game. And the casino does not like those individuals on the property. In this game of dice, everything looks normal until a careful review of the tape. This is the subject, and then we have the victim here. But keep an eye on the subject's hands. We saw a female reach in underneath an individual's hand as the individual looked away and actually took those chips. Done. That's him. Today, Bill is tracking a blackjack player who's been winning again and again. Stay with him. Oh, he did a double back. Yeah. Oh, he's one of them shifty guys. The surveillance team suspects he may be what they call an undesirable. Okay. Undesirables aren't technically cheating, but because they're trying to beat the system, casinos ban them once they're identified. If this man is an undesirable, he may have been caught on tape before. Page needs a technological shortcut to find out. So he turns to facial recognition software. We take time-lapse snapshots of his face on a monitor, feed that information into the software program. He needs to find just the right angle and lighting if the photograph is going to work. There are 80 primary measuring points on the human face. The computer describes the face by plotting these points and measuring the variance between the features. Taken together, these points create a unique numerical code called a face print. The computer compares the suspect's face print to a database of undesirables from casinos around the world. But the final decision relies on a human being. That's him, that's the guy, good match. This time, the suspect is an actor testing the system. But facial recognition helps Paige's team investigate real undesirables one to two times a week. When we catch somebody doing something illegal or uh, out of the ordinary, it's a big deal in the room because we've caught something that is that's going to protect the property. We, we take that very seriously. Good. Thank you. Facial okay. recognition systems like this still rely on high-quality images and human decision-making. But in the case of the London bombing, even if the bomber's photos had been in a database, investigators most likely would not have made a match. The images were too blurry or shot from strange angles. But scientists are developing a new surveillance system that could take facial recognition into another dimension. 3D imagery tied to satellite tracking. It's technology that could help find anyone, anywhere on the planet. The challenge for future surveillance is not just to find a face in the crowd, but to identify one person anywhere on the globe. This lab is working on the next critical leap in technology. A giant dome uses 3D facial recognition to help identify people from virtually any angle. Police believe the CCTV pictures show them planning their attack. To find suspects in the London bombing, 
investigators had to screen tens of thousands of videotapes. They limited the search by time and place, and eventually found poor quality images of the suspects. Any observer would hardly give them a second glance. But facial recognition experts like Hans Peter Pfister know that a more advanced system could help in the future. Just look at the camera. It'll take some pictures of your face and then store them. Pfister knows the limits of the standard 2D facial recognition systems. While it can see through basic disguises, it can't identify people from the side. He puts it to the test. Eyeglasses don't throw off the recognition system. And it still works with a mustache, strange hair. So yeah, this is good. And even a beard. But if he simply turns his head, the computer doesn't recognize him because it can no longer measure the distance between his features. Fister hopes that his 3D dome will teach the computer what a face looks like from all angles. That's good. He must put his subject into precisely the correct spot to make the image accurate. Together, the cameras create a composite image. More than 64,000 individual points make up a full face. This completed 3D image is called an avatar. Fister can rotate or repose it to a frontal view to compare it to a database of faces. The hope is that someday all criminals will be ID'd from any angle. No, I think this is a very good scan. The 3D system holds great promise for future investigations, like the London bombing, where security cameras caught images from the side. This new technology might be paired with smart cameras, which could actually find faces and run them through a match system. The challenge for surveillance technology is to find individuals anywhere before they cause harm. And another lab offers a glimpse of a system that does just that. Fly to Boston. At a laboratory in Massachusetts, scientists are on a manhunt for a criminal. An FBI wanted poster arrives from headquarters. The wanted man's name is Thomas O'Connor. Thomas, that's our guy. O'Connor has committed bank fraud, embezzling hundreds of millions of dollars from banks around the world. They enter O'Connor's face into the recognition database. Using facial recognition software tied to millions of webcams placed on streets and buildings around the world, a global hunt begins. Fly to Tokyo. In each city, Government-run web cameras scan the streets, looking for a match. London. Toronto. They get a tip that O'Connor just entered the United States through New York. Look at the buildings. Yeah, of course. Every building in the city appears in three dimensions, allowing a bird's eye view. Let's check out the banks. Lair, banks. They ask the computer to show the location of every bank in New York. I think we need to focus on one area, head yeah. of Broadway. Let's check out this stream video. Okay. They scour Times Square, but there's no sign of O'Connor. They head to the financial district, Take this area. Okay, it's actually quite a big area here. A lot of activity in this area. So yeah, it'd be good to check if there's any webcam around this area. Thousands of webcams scan for a glimpse of O'Connor. And then, pay dirt. We have word. A sensor goes off. A camera spots O'Connor in the hallway of a bank building. He walked this hallway only seconds before. They have found his face 
amid a sea of millions of other faces. The report says that he's around this area. From the command room, they dispatch patrol units to the scene and make the arrest. That's perfect. This control room is fictional, but all these technologies already exist. They just haven't been brought together yet. When they are, it will be nearly impossible for an undisguised face to go undetected. While facial recognition technology is advancing, the future of surveillance isn't just identifying what you look like on the outside. It's already moving inside your body, spying not just on you, but in you. And it's tightening security on the most sensitive borders in the world. Airports, the crossroads for billions of people. And one of our most vulnerable points of attack. Surveillance technology is critical. And when it comes to controlling borders, the eyes are everything. Iris recognition is a mathematical system that uses the colored part of the eye to determine who you are. Traditional passports can be forged, but your identical twin or even your own other eye has its own unique uncopyable pattern. The iris is the only internal organ easily visible from the outside and it has a pattern that never changes, so it serves as an ideal living passport. Irises are normally more than 10 times more accurate than fingerprints and much more reliable identifiers than faces. You could easily be tricked into thinking this is a picture of the US vice president next to the president. But actually, Dick Cheney's eyes, nose, and mouth have been copied from Bush's face onto his own. It's hard to tell one face from another. There just isn't that much difference between them. There's not very much randomness in faces. If faces had as much randomness as irises, then different faces would have random numbers of noses, six noses and five mouths and three eyes in different random positions. Then face recognition would work pretty well. Cambridge University professor John Dogman is the inventor of iris recognition. It's the high degree of randomness in the iris that makes Dogman's system so powerful. His mathematical formulas are already helping track people along sensitive borders. The UAE counts on the system to catch people trying to enter the country illegally. So cool. 80% of those living in the UAE come from abroad. To control this flow of humanity, all foreign visa holders are tracked against an immigration blacklist, a database of 500,000 criminals and visa violators. The country scans about 7,000 people each day. Thank you. First, a scanner shoots invisible infrared light into the eye to locate and isolate the iris. Then, it plots the random patterns of the iris and constructs a mathematical equation called an iris code. In a single second, it compares this code against a half a million other codes in the database and searches for a match. Today, Inspector Ibrahim has found a problem with a man who has just arrived from Iran. In less than a second, the computer makes a half a million comparisons and shows that the pattern of his eye matches an iris code in the database. They find a match. He cannot come to UAE anymore. His ban is forever. The man is on the blacklist because he tried once before to enter the country without a visa. This time, his own body has betrayed him. He'll be returned on the next flight to Iran. The 
system has already caught more than 25,000 people trying to enter the country illegally. Iris scans ideas by peering into our bodies. But there's a new surveillance technology that can actually see through us in a virtual strip search. It's called backscatter. In this view, a woman appears almost naked, except for a plastic gun and explosive device hidden on her body. When this technology was briefly deployed at the Orlando, Florida airport, it raised privacy concerns and stirred an outcry in the press. Backscatter manufacturers are working on a way to cloak the human body. Until then, the government has put the technology on hold. But Backscatter can already do more than screen people. This unmarked van is screening an entire parking lot. Backscatter gives it the power to peer inside parked cars. The technology sees through metal and shows organic compounds like this plastic explosive. Deployed on borders around the world, Backscatter is a powerful weapon against smugglers. It can reveal things in an instant that would take a border guard hours to find. Viewed with a regular x-ray, this truckload of fruit in Hong Kong doesn't seem to contain anything suspicious. But Backscatter shows heroin. These bright white blocks hidden in the fruit. While it works in ways similar to x-rays, Backscatter shows things that regular x-rays miss. On the Guatemalan border, a truck of bananas isn't what it seems. Illegal migrants are clearly visible huddled beneath the fruit. Backscatter works by shooting high energy light beams at an object. These high energy beams penetrate dense objects like metal but bounce and scatter back when they hit low density materials like bananas or people. How the light particles scatter back reveals the shape of the object they hit. Even though new technologies can be invasive, they are tightening security where it's needed most. But the next challenge is to survey an entire city Millions of people, thousands of places, even at night. With technology so powerful, they could end up seeing what they're not supposed to. August 27th, 2004. A protest is underway against the Republican National Convention. Thousands of people mill in the streets. High above, music producer Jeff Rossner is in his 16th floor penthouse. With nothing but night sky above him, Rosner has a wraparound terrace and panoramic views of the city. Tonight, he's entertaining a date. It was Saturday night. My friend came over and we had a couple of glasses of wine and uh, we had music going and, you know, we we're just kind of spending time with each other and enjoying the night. After a few minutes, Rosner and his friend head outside onto the terrace. On this, as on all other nights, Rosner assumed he was alone outside. The terrace that I have is completely private. 16 floors up, there's no buildings around. I mean, if I'm up here and it's dark, you can't see me. But tonight, Rosner and his friend are not alone. And they're about to come face to face with the future.
10 miles away, a unique machine is gearing up for a night of surveillance. From this secure location, the New York Police Department Aviation Unit can turn night into day. The challenge is to see through the darkness and detect anything unusual happening in New York City. Okay, you're good. This $10 million unmarked Bell 412 EP helicopter comes equipped with the latest infrared technology. Its camera allows them to patrol Manhattan from thousands of feet in the night sky without being seen. The team flies more than 9,000 surveillance missions a year. Led by Deputy Inspector Gallucci, they keep an eye out for crime, terrorist activity, or any sort of trouble. We do quite a bit of surveillance around the clock. We look for anything that would appear to us to be out of the ordinary and unusual circumstances uh, at sensitive locations. Cruising at more than 130 knots, it will take only minutes to cover the 10 miles into the city. The surveillance team moves across Brooklyn, tracking their progress on real-time maps. Then, as they approach New York Harbor, they switch on the infrared camera and bring alive an invisible world. No one should be on Liberty Island after dark. The team scans the base of the statue to confirm that no one is tonight. From a specially designed surveillance console in the rear of the chopper, they view the Staten Island Ferry as it passes thousands of feet below. Final stop on their way to Manhattan, the Brooklyn Bridge. They zoom in from more than four miles away. An onboard computer lets the crew program a target area, like Times Square, into a GPS-guided system. In seconds, they're over their target. Flying around Manhattan is something that you never get tired of. It's a beautiful sight, but we always have to keep in mind that we're out there with a purpose in mind, but we're not taking a tourist ride. Everybody gives off heat and the surveillance chopper can track an individual from thousands of feet away, usually without them knowing. On the evening of August 27th, the protests continue far below Jeff Rosner's apartment, and the NYPD infrared chopper monitors the event. We were out there just monitoring the situation for crowd control purposes. And part of what we do is to surveil rooftops to make sure that there's nothing unusual going on on top of the building surrounding the event. The helicopter scans the neighborhood looking for problems. Meanwhile, Rosner's date is going well. It was a really kind of special evening with this woman. It was uh, just a beautiful night. The police film rooftop after rooftop. No signs of trouble. But then, something unexpected. As the chopper hovers over Rosner's roof, its camera reveals two people who clearly aren't interested in the protest. the camera stays over the roof and keeps recording for nearly four minutes. Months later, Rosner is stunned when a local television news reporter knocks on his door and shows him the footage. And it pissed me off. And I thought, this is wrong, man. This is, this is really bad. I'm glad the technology exists so it can protect me. But it saddened me to know that while a great thing, it can be misused. And the fact that it actually happened and I was the one that was in the eyesight, just like, hey, dude, do me a favor. Turn, turn the camera off, get out of my face. You know, this is my life, this is my night, you don't need to be here. 
Don't violate me. To Rosner, this is an abuse of surveillance technology. But the police disagree. Our intention is never to invade anyone's privacy. It's a matter of the police doing their job to try to protect the citizens. If some people determine that to be a violation of their rights and liberties, life has changed. This is a post-9-11 world, and this is the way policing needs to be done now. When the footage aired on the news, some felt that Rosner and his date's privacy was violated. But as technologies become more sophisticated, this is just the beginning. The tools of surveillance already go well beyond infrared cameras. And the police aren't the only ones watching us. Governments, law enforcement, and corporations use our own everyday objects to record our activities. Cell phones can track our movements through transmission towers and satellites. The cell phone physically tracks us. It sits in our pocket drawing a little map of where we've been and where we're going. Nearly every technology we use, from the swipe of an electronic key card in a door, to the scan of an easy pass at a toll booth, to the internet browser on our computers, leaves an electronic trail. We have devices and payment systems which leave behind little trails, like contrails behind jet planes. And surveillance in the 21st century now means picking up those trails and following right behind us in our footprints, or even leaping ahead and predicting where we're going to be before we get there. Using a technique called data mining, companies and governments feed these small details about our daily lives into massive data banks. Where you went to school, what you bought yesterday, what ails you how much you've saved for retirement, even where your demons lie. This information and much more is available to those who know how to look. Instead of the one big secret we don't want revealed, it's the million pieces of tiny little bits of information adding up to a digital image of ourselves, very refined, very precise, very predictable. If you know where I have been at 3.15 in the afternoon for the last 250 days, you can make very good guesses at where I'm going to be at 3.15 in the afternoon tomorrow. And if you know where I'm going to be at 3.15 in the afternoon tomorrow, there's almost nothing you can do. Already, surveillance technologies are everywhere. But perhaps the ultimate device won't watch us from the outside. It will live inside our bodies with the power to reveal not just who we are, but everything we do. The future of surveillance is hiding in plain sight at the Baja Beach Club in Rotterdam, Holland. This may look like a regular party, but it's no normal club. The Baja has an elite group of special VIPs who are different from other clients. They need no identification and no cash to buy drinks or food. To enter the club, all they have to do is offer up an arm to a scanner. And tonight, 21-year-old Ryoni Shuten will be joining the in-crowd. I just do it because it's more comfortable. They will bring you drinks and food instead of uh, you going to the bar to get it. But before he can party, Ryoni has a doctor's appointment. He's getting an electronic chip implanted in his arm. It's called radio frequency identification. An RFID chip is a small device that transmits a radio signal that's read by a scanner. In 2003, the Attorney General of Mexico and some of his staff received RFID implants inside their bodies to allow them access to sensitive areas. While it's not yet commonplace, 
Bryony's doctor has implanted nearly 100 chips. At first I have some doubt, of course, because you uh, are putting chips in healthy, pe healthy young people. But um, I think it's, it's the future. Each tiny chip has a number. A scanner connected to a database can instantly reveal who the person is and much more. Technically, there's no limit to the information the database can hold. This is the needle with which I'm going to implant the chip. The chip itself is little larger than a grain of rice. It will remain inside Rioni's body for the rest of his life, or until he undergoes surgery to have it removed. Rioni will need an anesthetic before the procedure. The chip is implanted just millimeters below the skin. If it goes in too close to the muscle, the muscle could be damaged, and Rioni will feel the chip when he moves. If all goes well, he won't even know it's there. Procedure is over in seconds. And now it's time to party. Although others have to pay cash at the entrance, when Rioni arrives, his name and number instantly identify him as a VIP member of the club. He makes his way to the VIP deck and uses his implant to buy a drink. Baja is a glimpse of a not-so-distant future. Already, some people have chips with critical health information. Some think that soon everyone will have a chip that will identify them and allow a new form of surveillance. Joe Van Gallen manages the club and likes to keep an eye on everyone, especially his chipped VIPs. I think that in uh, 20 years, uh, it, it will be a normal thing. I think when you get born, you get a chip, and uh, it will stay in your body for the rest of your life, and you get all kind of information on it. So if you got a problem, you read the chip, and then they know who you are. Implanted ID chips may be just the beginning. Future chips could be coupled with GPS tracking technology, making it possible to locate anyone, anytime, anywhere. Parents and pet owners are already using external GPS units to keep track of their loved ones. In the U.S., approximately 7,500 criminals are monitored by GPS. And these devices are only getting smaller. Although GPS implants aren't currently available, it might be only a matter of time before every criminal, perhaps even every citizen, has an ID chip. Once the stuff of science fiction, these surveillance technologies are becoming reality. But the more amazing they get, the more controversies they create. In the name of security, societies around the world are struggling to redraw the line between surveillance and privacy. The bill before me will help law enforcement to identify, to dismantle, to disrupt, and to punish terrorists before they strike. Just months after the 9-11 attacks, President Bush secretly ordered the government to listen in on some Americans' phone calls without getting warrants. Technically, snooping on communications is not difficult. Almost every phone call, fax, and email passes through a network of towers and satellites. This digital data can be intercepted with listening dishes or by using spy satellites. The U.S. alone has more than 30,000 eavesdroppers scattered around the world working with at least 100 spy satellites. 
every three minutes, they collect enough information to fill the Library of Congress. Governments tell us these technologies make us safer. But where is it all leading? More than ever, authorities say we need surveillance in a dangerous and wired world. Even half a million cameras couldn't stop the London bombings. New technologies like ID implants, iris scans, and facial recognition have the power to reveal anyone who has committed a crime or crossed a border illegally. But they also have the power to invade our privacy. In the future world of total surveillance, there may be nowhere to hide.